It's Pastor John here, and I'm so excited to be with you again this weekend and to get to share God's Word with you. Today, I want to talk to you about loyalty, because we're in a series called United, where we look at the fact that God calls us as followers of Jesus to be united with each other. And one of the best ways that we can be united is to have loyalty to one another and to our God. Loyalty is something that is valued not just in church, but really in almost every part of our society. If you do much shopping, you've probably got some of these loyalty cards. You know what I mean? Maybe you kind of gotten rid of the cards and just have it on your phone, but we've certainly had these loyalty cards that continue to uh, keep you shopping at that place. Or also, even with bad boys like Tony Soprano, he teaches us that we value loyalty above most other things in our society. And all of us, I think, would agree that this guy here is not cool. He's not the kind of guy that you want to be because we value loyalty and faithfulness. I mean, if I told you that I am 99% loyal to my wife and only a mere 1% loyal to that girl on the side, you would not be impressed, or at least you shouldn't be impressed, let me tell you, because that's not who we're called to be. Loyalty is a 100% kind of thing. It's a legit serious commitment that we have. Either I'm committed to you or I'm not. Either I'm loyal or I'm not. And I want to share with you a story today from the Bible about a woman named Ruth who's one of the most loyal people who you will ever encounter. Ruth lived at a time called the period of the judges. This happens in the Old Testament, the first section of the Bible. Okay, so God has called his people out of Egypt. Moses has led them through the wilderness and to the door of the promised land. Then Joshua takes over, takes them into the promised land. They conquer a vast majority of the land and they move in. And then soon thereafter, you're going to enter a period of the judges, which is about 400 years long. And this was a time that was not Israel's best time. There was a lot of chaos. And sometimes the people would live for the Lord, but a lot of times they wouldn't. The Bible says that in those days, every person did what was right in his or her own eyes. Sounds a little bit like today, doesn't it? Where we just kind of, sometimes people just kind of do what we feel like doing. We say things like, you do you, or if it feels good, do it. This is kind of how the period of the judges was working, and quite frankly, it wasn't working too well. Well, during Ruth's day, there was a serious famine in the land of Israel. And so I want to introduce you to a couple of Israelites. Uh, there was a woman named Naomi who was married to a man named Elimelech. And these were two Israelites, and they lived in a town called Bethlehem. You've probably heard of that little place, right? We celebrate the birth of a guy in December who is quite well known. Because Elimelech is actually, his family is going to be the family through which Jesus Christ uh, will come to this earth someday. So Elimelech is a Moabite. Famine, I'm um, excuse me, he's an Israelite from Bethlehem. Famine comes to Bethlehem. And so Elimelech decides to move his family. Now this was a radical thing. You got to understand, Israelites didn't just like pack up and move. You stayed living on the same land that your father and your grandfather and grand, great grandfather and all these folks had lived on. So they move away to Moab. Moab is not in Israel. It's another country. And quite frankly, this wasn't a great decision by Elimelech. Because the, when he moved there, there was a lot, more, a lot higher chance that they would start worshiping the gods of this country or that his sons would marry women from this country and these kinds of things that God did not want, not because of racism, but, or, but because God wanted them to remain faithful to him, not to these false gods that the Moabites worshipped. Well, Elimelech was successful there in providing for his family in the material sense, but he failed to provide in, in the spiritual sense. He took them to a place where they really shouldn't have been. So they, they moved there, and in a pretty short while, Elimelech dies, tragically dies. And Elimelech leaves his wife, Naomi, to raise the two sons, which she does. And they both get married to two Moabite women, Orpha and Ruth. And so this is where Ruth comes into the story. She's from Moab, and she marries now an Israelite guy. Tragically, after about 10 years, 
both of the, the sons of Elimelech and Naomi die. So now, if you're keeping track, you've got oh, three widows, Naomi and her two daughters-in-law, Orpha and Ruth. It's a horrible tragedy. And you've got to understand that in those days, it was an even bigger deal. It would be a big deal today, but it was an even bigger deal then. Because you see, that was a patriarchal society, which means that the men were kind of the ones who brought in the money and took care of the business and that stuff. That's not necessarily the right way to do things. It was the way that they did them in their society, though. So you've got three widows, which means you've got a huge problem. They can't provide for themselves. They've lost so much. Uh, there, there's pain, there's grief, there's financial issues, and, and so they're in a serious problem. Well, Naomi makes a decision. She decides that she needs to move back to her home country. She needs to go back to Bethlehem because the famine has passed. She's going to go back and find some relatives there and decide to, to, to uh, live there, and hopefully they'll help to support her. Well, the two girls, Orpha and Ruth, they're packing up as well, and they're all ready to head out together until Naomi realizes that there's a problem with this plan. Ruth chapter 1, verse 8 says this, But on the way, Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back to your mother's homes, and may the Lord reward you for your kindness to your husbands and to me. May the Lord bless you with the security of another marriage. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they all broke down and wept. No, they said, we want to go with you and to your people. Now, think about that for a minute. This was a really radical thing. I mean, imagine that, let's say you were a single person, and you met somebody who had moved to the United States from Canada, right? So you meet one of our Canuck neighbors here who's moved down uh, to Ohio from Canada, and let's say that you fall in love with this person and you get married to them. Okay, so this person lives, is here, and his or her mom is here as well, okay? And so you are married to this person from Canada, and you have a great life together and all this stuff, and then tragically, your Canadian spouse dies. It's just a terrible thing, and you're so heartbroken and sad and all of this, and the mom decides that she's going back to Canada, because Ohio was not really her home, and, and she wants to go back there. And let's say the mom is going back to Canada, and you say with her, hey, I'll go too. I'll go with you. Now that would be strange, wouldn't it? You're not from Canada. You're, you're from here. And why would you want to do I mean, nothing against Canada. I mean, I hear the maple syrup is great, eh? But it's just not the same, right? I mean, this is the land of the free, the home of the whopper. Are you sure you want to leave that? It's a risky thing to leave your people and all the stuff you know and everything to go with a mother-in-law who's almost kind of an ex-mother-in-law because you're not even married to her child anymore. It's probably not something that you would do. But this is exactly what Ruth had planned to do. And so Naomi replies to them, verse 11, and says, Why should you go on with me? Can I still give birth to other sons who could grow up to be your husbands? No, my daughters. Return to your parents' homes, for I am too old to marry again. And even if it were possible, and I were to get married tonight and bear sons, then what? Would you wait for them to grow up and refuse to marry someone else? Of course not, my daughters. <laughs> if we pause for a second there, this is, this is hilarious, right? Naomi is basically saying, girls, this, this is not a plan here. Okay, you, you can't come back with me. I mean, even if I could just get pregnant today, right? I can't give you sons. I mean, that, that's just weird, right? You're not going to say, oh, what a cute baby. I'll marry him in about 18 years. That's not going to happen. It's just not possible. She, she, so she's basically saying to them, girls, you shouldn't do that. But then she really gets to the heart of the matter here in the rest of verse 13. Things are far more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord himself has raised his fist against me. Naomi looks at the circumstances of her life. She's lost a husband. She's lost two sons. Before that, she left everything that she knew. And she says, surely God must be trying to crush me. Girls, I know you've lost your husbands, and I'm sorry, but you've got to understand, it's like my God is against me. Now, the Bible doesn't say that the Lord caused these things to happen. 
And it doesn't really even, notice she doesn't really even critique herself and Elimelech for their decisions to, to leave Israel, which was certainly part of the problem. But you know, you and I have had times like that too, I bet. Maybe not as deep as what Naomi felt, or maybe exactly what Naomi felt. Where we felt that God was just, just trying to crush us or against us. There was so much pain and hurt. And say, God, why? Where are you? Where are you in the midst of this? And this is exactly where Naomi is. A few verses later, she'll say this, Don't call me Naomi. Instead, call me Mara, which means bitter. For the Almighty has made life very bitter for me. I went away from Bethlehem full, but the Lord brought me home empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has caused me to suffer and the Almighty has sent such tragedy upon me? She's incredibly broken and hurt. She even asks to be renamed. She's called me bitter. Because the fact is, that's who I am. I had so much. And it's like God has taken it away. I'll go by bitter from now on because that's who I'm going to be. She went from wife to widow, from mom to ex-mom. Who was she now? What did her future look like? In a world where men call the shots and have a lot of the money, it was like she had lost her love. She had lost her boys. She had lost her retirement, her social security, her dreams, all these things. Gone. Bitter. I'll go by bitter from now on. And, you know, the Bible doesn't tell us why these things happened. It doesn't give us an explanation. It just says that they happened. Because the fact is, a lot, that's how a lot of life is. Tragedy strikes sometimes. It doesn't mean that God causes everything, as Naomi said that it did. But tragedy happens. You've been there, I've been there in our own way. And we know what it's like to hurt. We know, what, we know what it's like to feel that. And the Bible never says that you can't be angry with God. It never does. In fact, some of the biggest biblical heroes got angry with God multiple times in their life. God is big enough to hear your hurt. He's big enough to, to heal or to, to uh, experience your pain. He wants to bring healing. And sometimes we got to express some hurt to him. That's okay as well. In fact, it's important. But you know, in the midst of all this pain, Naomi made a really what was a selfless decision. She told the girls they could go back home instead of going with her. Verse 14, And again they wept together, and Orpha kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. But Ruth clung tightly to Naomi. Look, Naomi said to her, Your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. You should do the same. And don't miss this. This is so central because she's saying, not, don't just go back home, but you go, you go worship your gods. Quite frankly, Naomi is a terrible evangelist. <laughs> she just is. She's basically like, hey, my God's basically trying to crush me here, so why don't you go back to your own God and your own family, and you try that because it is not working out here for me. Interestingly, the god of the Moabites, his name meant literally destroyer. So she's sending him back to a god who's not necessarily a good god. But Naomi is so broken and so hurting that she sends them back. She basically says, look, your sister's gone. What are you waiting for here, Ruth? Why don't you go too? Verse 16, but Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said nothing more. Now look at this contrast. Here is Naomi, a woman who has not lived God's way 
and for whatever reason has experienced a lot of pain as a result. And then you have Ruth, someone who did not grow up knowing about the Lord or experiencing the Lord, but she has experienced the goodness of God through this family, through her husband, and even through Naomi. She's experienced the God of Israel. And, and now she's with this woman who wants to go by the name Bitter, who is a terrible evangelist, who is the, the ultimate Debbie Downer. And she says, no, I'm not going back home. I want to go with you. I want your people to be my people, your home to be my home, your God to be my God. And listen, for Christians, we should be the best when it comes to loyalty. Because we have a loyalty on a totally different level than Tony Soprano has loyalty, okay? Because our loyalty is not just to a person, it's not just to a family, it's not just to a set of values. Our loyalty is to God, first and foremost. And loyalty is only an honorable characteristic when your loyalty is ascribed to something good. In fact, to someone good. You can be loyal to all the wrong things. You can be loyal to addictions. You can be loyal to unhealthy people. You can be loyal to unhealthy habits or situations. That kind of loyalty is not good for you. What are your real loyalties in life? And I don't mean like theoretical, I mean real. If, if you looked at the way you spend your time, your talent, your money, your relationships, the way that you invest yourself, that tells you where your loyalties are. How do you feel about those? Are you proud of them? Are they the kind of things you would want others to follow you in and be loyal to you in? Or would you say, man, I don't want people to be messed up in the stuff that I'm messed up in. We need to consider where our loyalties lie and to whom our loyalties lie. Naomi had gotten off track in life. Her pain, her hurt, her anger, hey, fair enough. She had been through a lot. Notice that when Ruth makes this incredible profession of love and loyalty to Naomi, Naomi's response is just silence. She just zips it. She realized she's not going to be able to argue Ruth into anything. And, and, and you know, it makes us ask, why on earth would Ruth want to do this? And I truly believe that the only logical answer is that she knew Naomi's God. She had encountered the power of Naomi's God, and she wanted more of it. I want your God to be my God. I'm not leaving this God. I'm not leaving you. You may be a train wreck right now, but I'm not leaving you because I want your God. I don't want these other false gods that I used to worship. And let me ask you, friends, is your faith that magnetic? Is it that attractive to others that people say, yeah, I want the faith that she's got. I want the faith that he's got. That's the kind of faith I want to define my life because I see how different you are. They, they see how different you are. They see how your faith has changed and shaped your life. And, and they say, I want to be loyal to that kind of God. Do you live a life? Do you have a faith that is, that's that kind of faith? If not, it's not too late to start. Let me tell you, it's not too late to start. Ruth sets a high bar for loyalty, both to a person. She was loyal to Naomi, even when Naomi was a difficult person to be loyal to. But she also sets a high bar in her loyalty to God. She is loyal to God above everything else. This is the type of loyalty that we don't see very often. More often we see a loyalty that says, What's in it for me? How is this going to help me or benefit me? And I want to encourage you to have a loyalty that's different than that. It's a loyalty that is learned, honestly. It's a loyalty that we understand because it was modeled for us. Romans 5 verse 8 says, But God showed His great love for us by sending Christ to die while we were yet sinners. God is faithfully committed to his people, even when we are faithless. Even when you and I disobey or hurt him or go down the wrong path 
or pretend like we can just do this all on our own and we don't really need God. God is faithful to you. Maybe you've had some Naomi-like experiences in your life. Maybe you realize you've kind of been the one shaking your fist at God. I want you to know he loves you. He cares for you. In fact, he forgives people like me and you because we need that forgiveness. We serve a God who is so faithful, who is so loyal, if you will, to us, that he would send his son, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God's love for you is unconditional, unearned, undeserved. You, you can't deserve it. You can't even lose it because he loves you that much. Regardless of how many steps you've taken away, it's just that one step back. In a moment, we're going to celebrate Holy Communion together. You might have uh, uh, bread and juice there at home, and we invite you to grab that if you wish and, and uh, participate with us physically in that. Or if you don't, you can just participate with us in, spiritually, in spirit. That works as well. And we're going to celebrate a God who is so loyal that he would give his own son for you. That's how big our God's commitment is to you and to your salvation and my salvation. He gave his life for us so that we too can have eternal life. God's love is inseparable from us. No matter, no matter where we go, it's still with us. Nothing, the Bible tells us, can separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ. Not height or depth or angels or demons or anything else in all of creation can separate us from that incredible love in, in, that God has for you. So what do you need to lay down in order to pick up your cross and to follow Jesus, to have that kind of loyalty to him? What do you need to do to be more loyal to your, your brother or your sister? What is God calling you to do this day? Let's be a people who does that this week. Would you pray with me? God, we give you thanks for the gift of loyalty, for how you yourself were so loyal to us even before we could ever earn it. And we th we're thankful that we can't earn it because it's that good of a gift. God, we thank you for unconditional love. I pray that you'd help us to show others that kind of love, a love that we learn because you first loved us. God, we do love you, and we pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.